All right, we got Christopher Hills asking, can you tell us the difference between War One era kilts and modern kilts? Can I? I don't know. Would you Would you like to take a stab at it? Um, World War One kilts. World War One, yes. <clears throat> um, well, the straps definitely different. Um, the Mac is the historian. Mac is the reenactor, not me. <laughs> um, I know enough to be dangerous, but not not that much. Um, so I'm going to make my bullet point list and let you say whether I'm right or wrong. Okay. Um, so differences between current contemporary kilts and World War One. Mm-hmm. Um, the straps. Well, the stra- I'm going to guess he's, me- he's meaning military kilts. So I yeah, yeah. Okay. So. Well, it's at World War One, so yeah. yeah, military. Okay. So I'm going to say the straps, the color of the straps, the number of holes in the straps, mm-hmm. the style of buckle. Um, the placement of the straps, meaning four inch rise versus not four versus two mm-hmm. inch rise. Um, the banding, the waistband at the top of the kilt, mm-hmm. potentially the type of pleating, um, the tartans that are available, obviously military mm-hmm. tartans are a lot less. Um, and these, the type of the weight of the cloth, um, and, or the color of the straps. I don't know if I said that black versus like tan yeah or like brown leather mm-hmm. um and or the fabric ties that could be on some mm-hmm. pleading to the set versus pleading to the stripe and style i think i said style like rolled or military box pleat versus standard knife pleat yeah i mean for the most, how'd i do you did pretty good Sweet. yes there's the difference between the two yes and no um some stuff is done Similarly than what we do now, some stuff hasn't changed at all the way we do stuff. Um, I've seen the gamut of one strap, two straps, three straps, no straps, using webbing for straps. Um, using we've looked at a there was a tool tape or webbing like not they didn't have it, nylon webbing. It would have been, it would have been webbing. It was uh, they used a lot of times uh, you see field made ones where they took their um, their equipment straps. And would cut okay. them off old pieces of equipment and reuse those <clears throat> those straps as on the kilt. Then, yep. Um, we have seen a was a manufacturer out of Philadelphia that was supplying kilts to the what I Canadians? believe Canadians. What's that? Was it the Canadians they were supplying? I believe it was the Canadians. It makes more sense that way than to the British government. Um, but they were issuing to the uh, the CEF. And they have their own weird version of a strap, which is just cloth. They took a piece of the scrap of the, of the tartan and made their own, their own strap out of it. Um, and then you see usually a two-prong type uh, buckle on them versus a single prong, which is m- most people use now. Uh, pleating, as far as... Well, I've talked to the curator at the Black Watch Museum in Perth. And they have seen, they had four kilts from one unit, specifically one unit. They were all made differently. So you had one that was knife pleated, one that was rolled pleated, one that was box pleated. So you get that variant in that. Then you get one, you get three of them that were pleated to the stripe. One was pleated to the set. So you have variances all in that for just one unit. But the basic construction of a kilt, is the same then as it is now. It's just the little the little details are different. Yeah. The the thing that I find most um, uh, amusing, the, the biggest fallacy, I guess, that would be put forward that I find most amusing is that, like, this is how it was done. This is the military-style kilt. There's only one way to do it, and that's completely wrong. There are literally, like, dozens, like, currently, there are dozens of different kilt companies making kilts for the Scottish military and I know several of them and they're all doing them differently. They all have their own ways mm-hmm. to do it. Ultimately, what you get is what looks like a kilt from outward appearance and they're all going to be very, very similar and to the untrained eye, it's going to look effectively the same. But there's a lot of internal steps. There's a lot of little tiny things that are different from one manufacturer to the next um, you know, just like, you know, Ford makes a different ch- car than Chevy, but they both go down the highway. So it's, it, there's a lot of little tiny differences that really are uh, magnified when you start, you know, really paying attention to it. And the general public 
the, the this there's this weird just assumption that it's all the exact same. Yeah, it, it's it's a it's a it's something that I struggle at least in the in the reenacting community where it, it's it's fantasized like it's oh it has to be the, this is how it was done. No, it's not. It's once you get into especially into the into you know nineteen you know fourteen fifteen you're really starting, they're subcontracting out. So you're getting this kilt maker, this kilt maker, this kilt maker, this kilt maker, and you're getting all the mills weaving different stuff. They just want it to look the same. They don't care how the end product is. It just has to look the same. Yep. And, and that's the end result. Mm-hmm.